Good morning and welcome to this festive webinar to discuss what makes a great LinkedIn post. So I'm delighted to be joined by two great uh, exponents of LinkedIn in how to grow your um, business and personal brand. So that's uh, Samantha Mitchum from uh, what's the name of your practice again, Samantha? SJCM Accountancy. SJCM, and my apologies there. Okay. And uh, Chris Downing, the personality of the year from uh, the one and only Sage Software. So congratulations on that. And as always, Thank you very much. joined by... Uh, Chris, who is the lady that keeps the show on the road. So thank you, uh, Chris. So um, after that rather appalling uh, introduction there, um, Chris, do you want to, uh, can I ask Samantha and Chris to give uh, a bit more of a detailed introduction to yourselves and really how long you've, you've been using LinkedIn? Okay, so I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so my name is Chris Dang, uh, Director of Accounts Bookings at Sage. Uh, I basically call myself the conscience of the customer at Sage. So being an accountant for almost 20 years, I really understand uh, how the profession is changing, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and obviously that clear challenge which we have with clients. But it's also more importantly what's happening in the market. So when it comes to LinkedIn, well, um, I've been a user of LinkedIn, oh, I would say maybe eight, nine years, but... As a user, I would probably just say I was a lurker. So I wasn't working the working the platform. I was literally just on it, viewing. Um, I had really quite a low um, followers when I was in practice, maybe five, 600 max. It wasn't until maybe 2017, 2018, where I started to realize actually, um, as a practice, as an accountancy firm, uh, there was really good uh, benefit from actually being a little bit more visible, trying to bring out not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it, the personalities, etc. So I started to do a few more posts. I wasn't really doing posts. I was actually just looking what people were actually saying. Um, and it wasn't really until I joined Sage that I started doing a few more. But when I say actually a few more, it was literally maybe a post once a month. It was actually sod all, really. It was nothing yeah. really in terms of anything tangible. Um then we came into COVID. COVID was a strange old period because we were in lockdown, working from home. Uh, what content do you want to talk about? Because really it was all about accountants and bookkeepers working with their clients. I wasn't really in the thick of it. Um, and then the end of 2021 came along. I was sort of allowed out to play. Events were going on and really that's where... I started to do more um, social media posts, not in terms of what I was doing, where I was going, seeing people, but also more importantly what Sage was doing, because it was very much in terms of uh, how we were working with different accounting partners, what we may have acquired. And then certainly in 2022, with that little thing called making tax digital, um, I was really able to start bringing to life maybe this, not just the challenges, but the benefits, the opportunities, and everything goes with that. And that's created the engagement. And then it's having the mixed content, which I was actually producing as well. Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much. Um, Sam, yourself. Thank you. So, yeah, my name is Sam Mitchum. I run a small practice on the Lancashire Yorkshire border, SJCM Accountancy, which I set up in 2019 after working in practice for oh, a good 12 plus years. Um, in terms of the LinkedIn journey for me, um, similar to Chris in the respect of when I was working in practice, um, I was kind of there but not doing much with it. In all honesty, I didn't understand it as a social media platform. Um, you know, I didn't see it as a place to kind of um, just post like generic what was going on moments like it seems to be now. Um, whether that's just kind of my lack of understanding at the time or whether it has changed that much, I'm sure we'll like, explore during this chat. But my usage of LinkedIn um, really took off in 2021 when I did my series um, where I posted, I committed to posting five times a week. So Monday to Friday, 52 weeks of the year. And that for me was all about the consistency piece. So I thought, right, OK, let's hit social media. Um, having started my own practice, the first thing I did was Facebook and Instagram, tried to get kind of a local following on there to try and gain clients, um, especially in the local area. And the pandemic gave me a good kind of starting point because I was able to put out really helpful tips and tricks and, you know, updates about what was going on. But then 2021, when I committed to posting on LinkedIn, for me, it was a bit of an experiment. 
I was gaining clients from, um, well, locally near to where I live, but I thought, well, if I'm going to spread wider, I need to go on a platform that has that kind of further reach. Um, so I did it, I stuck to it, posted five times a week. So every day, Monday to Friday, during 2021, very consistent tax tip Tuesday on Tuesdays was the one that really took off. So that's what kind of got me, um, well, started to gain clients really from that. And that was just a case of, I think, people thinking, well, I'm getting more, ta- you know, kind of little bits and nuggets of information that are useful to my business from watching this accountant that doesn't act for me on LinkedIn. So let's reach out to her. And that was kind of the the way that the clients came in on the back end of that, really. Um, and then from there, obviously, anybody that knows me and follows me on social media will see that I've done a lot of um, public speaking in the accountancy space now, which It is something that I'd always kind of thought I'd like to do, but didn't necessarily think I'd have an opportunity to do as much as I have now done. Now, really, that all comes from LinkedIn. Yes, it does come from connections at software vendors and what have you, but it's LinkedIn that's kept that consistency and and I've kept showing up that's kind of kept my name in the forefront of, of kind of the minds of those people that are running webinars or, you know, when it comes to speaking at the events. Um, And at the end of the day as well, I have enjoyed what I've done on LinkedIn. And I think that's really important. So it hasn't just been a case of I'm growing a business and this is a way to get clients. It's a bit of a journey for me. And it's it's an easy way for me to reflect back on how far I've come with the business and, you know, where I started on LinkedIn to where I am now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And just for reasons of completeness, I'm not sure when I exactly joined uh, or set my first account up on LinkedIn. Um, But I know when I was working in corporate uh, life, my 2011 plan, which I put forward, the draft plan, actually included some sales training or or training for the sales team on LinkedIn. And it was very swiftly kicked into touch on the basis that these things don't really work, do they? They're just a bit of a faff and and a waste of time for the sales team and they should be doing what people perceive sales teams should always do so that's quite interesting especially as that business then about three years later made a big fuss about how they were going to train their entire global sales team so that was um yeah that was quite interesting and the other uh, the other little nugget being an irish catholic i have a massive um extended family and one of my um uh, very intelligent and successful cousins uh, was working for ft.com as their technology journalist and so he got sent off to um silicon valley to do a tour of some great and good businesses and also some startups. And he told me that he came out of one, he, well, he walked into one particular business, which had about 12, you know, geeky developers all sat around trying to create some community for people. And he thought this will never take off. And that business was actually linked in. So, so there we go. Um, that was a long time ago, uh, obviously. Um, yeah. circa around 2010 uh, when um, Ben did that. Anyway. So, so that's our bit, bit of a background. Uh, one of the things which I think we all uh, agree with on this call is that um, followers are not the be all and uh, end all of what you should be driving your um, LinkedIn journey on. So I like the fact that um, Sam already referred to that she wants to enjoy uh, what she's doing and the content that she's putting out, as well as you know offering valuable content to existing clients and potential clients. Uh, but also that that feeds into kind of being yourself and being authentic uh, when you're when you're on LinkedIn. Um, so. Chris, I know um, when you were in the green room just before we went live on this, you were making some comments about uh, followers. So would you just like to kind of amplify on the points that I've just made? Yeah, I think it's it's very easy to be uh, encapsulated by your following number. How important is that to you? And then when you look at, let's say, other influencers, advocates, accountants, technology providers talking on LinkedIn, you think, oh, they've got 10,000, 5,000, 50,000 followers, I need to try and get more followers. Why are you doing that? Because at the end of the day, it comes down to where you're happy and why you're on the platform. And I think it's more important to be thinking about what, why and who you are, what are you doing on the platform? Because are you an accountant in trade, trying to learn and understand what's happening in the industry? Are you trying to actually win new business or, or by accidentally winning new business because you're out there commenting and talking about what you're doing? 
are you uh, working for a technology provider and therefore you're trying to sort of tell everyone about what you're doing as a business, try and get your brand out there, maybe an element of you as an individual, but also are you someone who works alongside the technology providers, the accountants, and therefore are you an influence, an advocate, uh, a mentor, a coach, and therefore you're trying to sort of get engagement for what you're doing. But the trouble is the followers. Followers are only relevant if those followers are actually there, existing, listening, look, looking, reading what you're doing. And I think some following groups have actually been built up over several years and people probably come out of love with the platform. I think it's what comes under relevance of the engagement which you're getting. Um, so I do think followers is one of the numbers which people do, follow, do actually recognise and engage with and try to track. But actually, I think what's more important if, if you're trying to say use LinkedIn properly as a tool is understand why do I get engagement? Why have I got more likes or why have people started commenting? Is it because the nature of the post is quite relevant to the day, to the period, to the month or whatever? Um, did I use imagery? Did I use video? Have I asked questions? The type of people engaging with your post and how they engage, I think it's more important to measure if you do actually measure your, your LinkedIn and posts and what engagement you do get over time. Yeah. Good. Um, Sam, have you got anything to add? <laughs> I think from, from my point of view, I am very, very lacking on in terms of tracking anything to do with followers. Um, obviously, I do notice when there's been an influx of new followers or um, <clears throat> when a post has got a lot of engagement and a lot of likes. Um, but there's two reasons for that, really. I think because the aim of the game for me hasn't been about just ramping up numbers. Um but also because I think it can be a very slippery slope from my point of view. I, I've spoke to a lot of people that seem almost obsessed with the likes and just that whole um, mental health piece behind social media. I think it's a bit of a slippery slope and a bit of a dangerous place to put yourself when you really, really concentrating on likes. Because do you know what? Some of the posts that I've put a lot of thought of effort into, a lot of time into, thought would land really well, haven't. And they've got absolutely no engagement. There's been other posts where I've literally took a quick selfie, put a few words together, put it out there, boom, and it's done really well. So I think just that fact alone can kind of prove that it, it can be quite unhealthy to fault to just focus on the likes. Obviously, we're all doing it to, to get the engagement. But I think it's important to remember there are a lot of people that will still be seeing the content and liking it in real life that don't then hit that button. Yeah. Yeah. And and the other point is that content, you know, hangs around a long time, doesn't it? it does, you, yeah. Even you get the no notification, sometimes something you posted three, four weeks ago and you think that topic is completely dead, all of a sudden you get a, a few notes. And and Chris, you made a, a couple of very sharp observations when we were chatting beforehand about the actual, um, you know, promotion of this webinar and how we, you know, you yourself put a, a very clever, um, you know, graphic tile together. Um but it's been actually quite hard work to get people to sign up for this webinar, hasn't it? Where I actually thought this one would, you know, really fly. Well, it probably comes down to understanding how LinkedIn works. LinkedIn loves content where it's content which is driving engagement within the platform. So as soon as you start putting links to YouTube or any other external content, whether that's a blog or even maybe a link to a Zoom for, for a Zoom webinar sign up, LinkedIn really does not like that. They'll start to devalue the post. And what we possibly, what I did actually as an experiment, literally for this webinar, is um, yes, there was a nice little image of the three of us in Santa hats. That should be quite engaging. That's um, it, certainly head turning. That should have created the engagement. For people to say, "I want to sign up for this," not just because we're there talking about it, but it's a different image which we would have seen on LinkedIn. And then I thought, well. I'll do a really stussy video, as you said. So therefore, it's like all this LinkedIn content behind me, doing some of the mobile device, really graphical, really engaging. Uh, but the reason why both of those posts were all from all three of us really just bummed in terms of engagement is because we had an external link to Zoom. And therefore, LinkedIn wasn't actually promoting that as such to people's feeds. And I think this goes back to what Sam was saying is don't get hepped up if you're likes or your comments on a post don't fly is because sometimes you may not be feeding the LinkedIn algorithm and the LinkedIn algorithm is looking for content it's looking for discussion um, it's make it doesn't like it when you share someone else's post it doesn't like it if you like or comment on your own post and therefore if you've got external links just be mindful yes so quite a few people see it but you may not get the engagement which you're expecting 
yeah yep very uh you know very good points so um in terms of that, then, and I think so you've, you've covered some of those posts uh, just there, Chris. What what actually you know makes a really good post then? Um, like Sam, I've never really thought or measured how LinkedIn performs from my own um, personal circumstances. But Dermot, when you raised that sort of top one hundred LinkedIn followers back in July, I was intrigued. And um, once you're an accountant, you're always an accountant. You want to analyze the data, audit it, and what understand what the hell's going on yeah so i was even sadder than you rather than just <laughs> listing out the top 100 people been on a spreadsheet and tracking how many followers they have in the month um i actually have a spreadsheet of the top 50 and every post they've made in 2022 so i have a spreadsheet with currently six thousand lines of data uh with all the individuals the number of likes the number of comments etc and that fuels my better understanding in terms of what makes a good linkedin post because from those, you can identify the ones which are pushing out to an external link, uh, maybe to a YouTube channel. They literally just do not land as well. But then you do identify those really, really good posts. And also, our memories are quite short term. And when you think about what were the great posts of 2022, uh, some of us will probably be challenged to think, well, that was really good. So if you want to understand who are the top 10 or top 100 posts in 2022, they are as following. The three people are actually owning the platform. I like uh, Francesca, Jay Williams, uh, Lawrence Fishman. They have 86 of the top 100 posts in, in 2022. Now, obviously, they have a lot of followers. So they naturally get a lot of engagement. And when I talk about the top 100, these are people who are getting more than 1,000 likes on a single post. However, what it does go to show is the quality of the post you're making. How relevant is it to the theme, which what people are talking about? Is it quite engaging? Is it a bit of video? Is it an image or is it a talking point? And really the person who has actually won in 2022 in the most high flying post um, is our friend Heather Elkenden. So her post gave 146,000 likes. And this was in back in February. And this was the, if you can recall, it is the one with the video of going back to work and getting your team saying, are you going left? Are you going right? Can you stay home or come to the office? And I think that's a really good example of talking about something, creating in visualized content, which was of the moment. It was February, March time. People were deciding, do I go back to the office or not? And also that's a really nice, let's say, social media uh, mixed platform takeover because you got like 4 million views on TikTok as well for that video. But putting Heather to one side, We've also got um, Gwilym Davies. Now, he rarely gets any massive engagement on a post, but he did extremely well. When we were talking, he basically created that comment about the fact that um, it's hard enough retaining talent in a county firm. Just imagine the cabinet. So it had the imagery of, let's say, a couple of chancellors, a couple of prime ministers, and that just that really landed well. That had a lot of bounce. It goes to show it doesn't matter how many followers you've got. It's all about the quality of the content landing content which is a part of the moment so it's all about not just having a single post which works well it's also having an element of consistency and i do think consistency works as sam showed back in 2021 with a theme of every day that created that stream of content landing in someone's let's say virtual linkedin inbox for them to engage with and work with yeah well heather is um uh, in actual fact, when I um, released the original post on about uh, what well, time it was, about 8.30 on a Sunday morning, uh, uh, Chris, you were, I think, about the first person to respond and uh, with a like. And then within about five minutes, you'd added uh, a couple of people that I'd missed off. And, and Heather was actually, um, you know, one of them. So and she's clearly um, quite an astute user of, um, you know, social media. And it's very interesting what you've just said there about her very very talkable post but she does post um on a range of topics around you know recruiting people and how they've done it in go proposal and also some of the um kind of walk, how, how she relaxes with walking breaks hasn't she she did a nice video about walking in um south wales uh well probably a couple of months ago now so that's that's very interesting and well, sorry, sorry, that's her expertise though isn't it? you what, sorry, sorry? No, i was going to say that that's really her expertise isn't it She's running the operations of Go Proposal. It's all about the team around her, growing that business, nurturing the right people. And this is the thing is, if you're going to be talking around LinkedIn and you're going to, let's say, have that 
um, almost half over from how you run your business to actually how you want to be seen on LinkedIn. Bring that expertise and insight is so important. And that's what she brings to the platform. And that's how she speaks. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and it's also true. I mean, I've never actually um, spoken to Heather on a one-to-one, but you do feel that with her um, constant, um, you know, constant poach that, that, that she is, again, she's very authentic. She's very realistic. It's good content. So you do feel that you actually know her quite well and um, you kind of trust her content that she puts out that it's of, um, of real value um so yeah she was interesting i mean Gwilym's also interesting i mean he has got a quite a decent um following um you know he's just about creeps into the top 20 i think he's got about 11 12 000 followers off the top of my head um and some of them they well when he was with diagnostax he was deliberately quite kind of controversial wasn't he in terms of some of the imagery that they use you know copying the i mean i'm sure sam is far too young for a sex pistols album cover but um you know never mind the you know you you know what cover um so and some of that stuff so very deliberately um controversial when he was at diagnostics but since he's kind of moved on from there his, his post quite recently are very much um again with a theme around being green and and he did a lot of charity work didn't he at the start of the um ukraine war um so he certainly certainly is very active and he, he again was one that i knew was a regular poster but i didn't cr- realize quite how how kind of big he was um so for Sam, your, yourself, what's been your actual best post of uh, this year? Oh, that's a great question. Best post in terms of engagement. Chris, does your spreadsheet give this information? <laughs> when I say I don't track it, I really don't. I, I was just thinking, actually, when I said that I didn't track it, the only thing I have tracked is actually how many clients I've got from LinkedIn and then clients that have then come from those clients. But that, that's a different topic. Um, in terms of what you just asked, Chris, do you know what's my best performing post of 2022? Yeah, I do. And that post I'll leave is, you to that. Um, I looked on the link. <laughs> it's, the, it's the three years of employment one. It's the one back in June, just before you went on holiday, and you're talking about how uh, it's the fact that back at last, after running your own business for okay. nearly three years, you're in a position where you can go on holiday with your yeah. daughter. Yeah, so I think that that just... That displays a proof of the authenticity um, piece, doesn't it, in terms of I was going on holiday. It was the first time I've been abroad in a long time. It was the first time I took a, an actual week off work for a long time. So I think that just proves the relatability factor. You know, it was summer holidays. There's probably a lot of especially um, people running their own business, maybe their own accountancy practice that could relate to that post. Um, so I think that just proves that actually what that was doing is probably pulling on people's emotions Um, you you know, whether they were thinking, oh, brilliant, Sam's finally having a break when they can all see that I work very hard, or whether they were actually reflecting that onto themselves and thinking, wow, yeah, this is the first summer that we're going to have a holiday as well. So I think that does just prove that by opening up a little bit of vulnerability, because I am sharing quite open and honest kind of thoughts, feelings, what I'm going through emotionally and and kind of the ups and downs of running a business. Um, so that being the the kind of most successful post I've made I think it just proves that point that keeping it real being real on LinkedIn and sharing things that might make you feel a little bit vulnerable but at a point where you're still comfortable to share is actually where that success piece comes from Um, I just wanted to pick up on when you were just discussing about Heather as well and I know somebody's just put it in the chat that um, when Dermot was saying you know having not actually met her as a person um Well, having met her as a person a few times, she is exactly who she comes across to be on social media. And I think that is a very, very important thing. It's something that I've certainly always tried to do um, from the start of being on the platform for no other reason, really, than at the end of the day, I went on the platform to gain clients. And there's no point me making myself out to be somebody I'm not for a potential client that might come and sit in my office and have a conversation with me to then realize, oh, right, well, she's not this down to earth person that she's made herself out to be on LinkedIn. Um, And I think that's really important in in respect of keeping it real and and being yourself and who you are. Super, yeah, yeah, really good. Well, yeah, personally, I think the authenticity is massive and that, um, well, I can never be, you know, someone else that that particular fa- facade would last about five minutes. So I think it's really important that you um, you are yourself. And as as we know, uh, I think it's Des O'Neill who first taught me the line that um, love me or hate me, there's no money in the middle. So, um, yeah, be yourself. 
Love be that. yourself. So we have had a question come in um, from uh, one of the attendees. So uh, thank you, Richard. Richard Bruin. So Richard has um, asked the question, each, which is about newsletters. Um, so Richard has found that his own engagement has shot up since he switched from emails based letters to LinkedIn ones <laughs> and having chatted with him last week I think um despite the fact he's probably been running this about a couple of months please um please confirm Richard um that he's up to 970 subscribers on his LinkedIn newsletter um without any real promotion that's just you know people following his accountant on a mission uh, process so there you go seven weeks he's been running it and he's up to just below a thousand subscribers so um do either of you uh, Sam I'll let you answer this one first um do, do you use LinkedIn for newsletters? Um, any experience of it? No, it's not something I've I've put any time or effort into, um, and it's not something that I know a lot about. So it, I'll be really interested. I'll, I'll go over to Richard's profile and have a look at that after this session. Um, I can I can totally see the power in that. At the end of the day, it's where a lot of people are hanging out now. So um, to get those subscribers going is obviously going to push people towards towards the profile. Is that um, in terms of? The, the subscribers then are they mainly um other accountants or is that a client newsletter what's what's the kind of subject matter behind them Dermot if you've if you've yep. had a look <laughs> sure with so well Richard is actually um the uh, co-partner of account for your future so the guy that yes. um, sits behind this so in terms of so Richard is a chartered accountant but he's actually been uh, running coaching his coaching business progress BB for about the last 10 plus years um so but Richard is very uh, big around uh, mindset and he's developed uh, I think the the title that he's using is accountant on a mission um, so certainly the audience is targeted at accountants in practice um, and you know certainly what he's doing is is going through a range of topics um, on a weekly basis that's weekly with two e's and not ea um, so um, so yeah so that's that's really as much but yeah Richard Bruin progress bb so he's um He's active on LinkedIn, so I'm sure he won't. Um, it won't be too much of a struggle to actually find find him. That's enough of a plugging for Mr. Bruin. God <laughs> bless him. Um, so, uh, Chris, any any views on newsletters? It's something that you've used yourself or seen used uh, positively by anybody um, anybody else. I haven't used it myself. It's finding time and priorities, and it wouldn't be a priority for me at the moment. Uh, it's, Sage is quite good at marketing itself, so it doesn't need me to do uh, those elements. But I suppose the, the newsletter is an interesting point. Why does it work well? It's not because you're actually literally just posting something in your profile, you're waiting for someone to stumble across it. The newsletter will actually go down as a notification in your feed. And if you imagine LinkedIn, certainly for the last nine months, has been forcing more notifications when you wake up in the morning. Things of interest, things of notoriety, things that are trending. And if you've actually subscribed to your newsletter, that'll then bounce up as something to read. Then also you'll get that copy newsletter going into your um, Outlook inbox as well. So therefore, it's a really good way of actually trying to capture people on both platforms, whether they're sat on Outlook waiting for an email to come through, or they'll get a notification of something to read on, uh, while you're traveling on the mobile device as well. That's why it works quite well. Super. Thank you for that analysis. Um, OK, so let's um, the next point which I um, wanted to chat through was what's changed on LinkedIn um, this year, if anything. Um, certainly, I wanted to start off with the topic of video. And certainly, Chris, you would be a fantastic person to talk about the use of video. So far away. Use of video. Um, I think it's not just video. It's trying to make the, engage, the content a little bit more engaging. And um, I used to do a lot of GIFs because if I was at an event and there was a lot of imagery, trying to bring that all together was quite a useful way because I just thought uploading a couple of pictures and people just to randomly fix through wasn't a way to actually showcase what happened at that event. So GIFs was the natural way forward. And at that time, when you're looking at trying to try create video, unless you're actually purposely recording something, um, unless it's a really good element of content, um, it was challenging to actually edit it. However, then, then this little thing called TikTok came along. And I must admit, it wasn't my uh, idea. Uh, Sam was actually the first person I saw to actually uh, do that hybrid takeover. Hello, Sam, yeah. They're doing that hybrid takeover, doing a couple of TikToks and publishing them on LinkedIn. And it's not because TikTok is a platform to actually market what you're doing. 
It's actually the uh, innovation as a platform to edit and manipulate videos, uh, bring sound in, bring your photos and do whatever you like with it. So even in the good old days, if you want to do something with a video, it was like use something quite expensive, uh, subscribe to it, and then also have a sort of a master's degree in terms of how to use it. Now, suddenly, video editing is so intuitive, it's so easy. You can literally do anything. And, and therefore, the use of maybe me using video on LinkedIn is a couple of ways. One, in terms of um, if I've got to see someone or we're going to an event, bringing to life what that event was. So using various snippets of content, videos, photos, bring together in terms of the, the TikTok app, splicing them, putting my soundtrack, putting some words, and then publishing on LinkedIn. That's how it works quite well. But then also maybe doing a little bit something a little fun, a little bit of story, maybe uh, uh, getting into a habit very quickly. All of that is all about how to use content in a more in, uh, engaging manner. Uh, and then here's the top tip. I think it's not just about video is becoming more popular on LinkedIn. It's actually trying to create that conversation, that engagement with the individual, which you're viewing as a, as a 2D, 2D video image to someone actually coming to life and talking to you. Now, obviously, LinkedIn has stopped released captions in the last couple of months. Now, even though captions sounds great, because how many times you've got LinkedIn uh, silent on your browser, you see a video, you see someone speaking, but you don't actually engage because you've got the volume turned down. So captions is a great way to actually understand what we're talking about. The trouble with captions is if there are auto captions, all sorts of weird words come through. So my top tip is uh, almost ignore the captions on LinkedIn. And if you want captions on your video, embed the captions within the video. And therefore the product I'm using these days is a product called CapCut, C-A-P-C-U-T. And that's the sister product of TikTok. So that's a desktop browser-based um, iPhone um, app. And which means it will do auto captions. You can edit them and then you publish them with part of the video. And I think that's a far more engaging way of actually using the content. But whether it's video, whether it's selfies, whether it's using GIFs, it's all about doing something different, a little bit more eye-catching on the platform. Yeah. And certainly, yeah, there's a couple of videos from your good self which stand out. So one would definitely be the hopping into the hammock. That was certainly very memorable. And also your um, very James Bond-esque uh, move of starting having with a cup of coffee in the, uh, I assume it's the Sage Canteen, and then whizzing around and turning into the debonair uh, man in a uh, black tie and suit that that was a pretty cool one as well sage canteen no, that was my home office i don't have an office <laughs> oh. <laughs> well there we go it's there we go yeah. then i'm very even more impressed thank you and of course sam um you've uh, done numerous numerous um videos this year so you did uh, one which i think i gave you um a pat on the back for on linkedin of course um which was when you were wandering through the local town high street with um was it with sage merch and trying to give some sage merch around that was pretty cool so i would ask you um and actually the use of some external um tools was something i wanted to come on to but in terms of you know and I suppose this is a really difficult question because creativity is very much down to the individual. But in terms of that particular one where you're walking through the, you know, walking through the high street, uh, it was giving away sage merch, wasn't it? And, or looking for it was, um, yeah, it was it was kind of promoting the MTD piece. So yeah. MTD self-assessment, just kind of raising awareness for that and um, kind of putting sage in the forefront. So, yeah, yeah, that's what it's about. I, you, you correct me very subtly there. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, but I mean, what, what kind of gave you the... Um, I suppose one the inspiration and two is it also the confidence to actually you know walk to your local high street because i can assure you there's no way i'd walk down you know sunderland high street with any um vendors um <laughs> merch and do do what you did there um so two parts to that question hey um i think the ideas they come to me very naturally but one thing i will say is that i've got a very simple notes section in my iphone for, and it's called post ideas and, and it is as simple as that yeah. so because it's constantly coming to me so things will happen in your everyday life that will make amazing posts and um, so I'm constantly coming up with the ideas now the whole <laughs> the post in question the walking around Manchester High Street holding a big sage banner and dancing around and being daft it just came to me it came to me in a moment where it wasn't a case of we want to do something for this. Have you got an idea that could work? It was more a case of just I'd be sat doing one thing and think, oh, do you know what? That would land really well if I was seen in a really busy place, kind of in a jokey way, pushing MTD for its software with Sage. And it's 
I've got I've got a folder of photographs that I haven't yet published um, that's for a planned post. But this is what I'm trying to get to here. The point I'm trying to make is that it's not a case of somebody asking me or of me needing to do a post about a certain subject. It's about me kind of building that content in the background and you guys haven't seen it yet, but I've got it. So I've got a folder in my iPhone gallery called Merch Spot. And every time I've been out somewhere using my Sage water bottle or having a hoodie on with auto entry on or whatever it may be, I've taken a selfie or I've got somebody to take a photograph of me with that merch because one day I'll put it all together into a video and it'll look really cool because I'll be in loads of different places with loads of different merch. So it's for me, it's all about not necessarily thinking, I want to post about this subject, what can I do behind it, but actually coming up with the ideas and then seeing where the ideas can then slot into a subject that you want to post about. Okay. Cool. Good. Great stuff. And just following through on that theme of um, uh, kind of tech, you know, Chris mentioned CapCut in terms of uh, captions are there any other external video tools that you use or do you just use what's on you know comes to standard on your um, respective mobile phones is that for me yeah, that yeah, one. yeah so, start with that one Sam, please. So all of my videos i mean if you go back to the tax tip tuesday ones that were you know a good part of two years ago now when i started that a lot of them are very low quality, lower quality because I've done them on a web a webcam of an older laptop. Whereas, kind of as my videos have gone on, the text just got better in general, and um, so that the quality has got better. I haven't used any apart from playing around on TikTok to make those videos with effects. I haven't used anything fancy and now have a ring light which is a stand but again it's literally 20 quid from bnm bargains like there is nothing behind my videos that mean that would mean that anybody isn't capable of making them if you see what i mean because i really haven't used a lot of tech or a lot of apps i do now have um somebody who controls my youtube channel for me well i never understood youtube so i do have an external party who is putting the captions on those videos putting little images within the embedded within the video because that's outside my comfort zone and i wouldn't be able to do that i realized i missed a point when you were talking about the post of me running around manchester about the confidence piece dermot um I think that is just a character trait i think there will be there are people that are never going to be comfortable making videos and i think from my point of view, it's it's better that those people find their way because there are there is so much space still for other forms of um en engagement in posts. You know, people do still like reading things. People love listening to podcasts where you don't have to put your face out there and do video. I yeah. think if you lack in confidence a bit, it can be you know it can be a great way to build confidence by starting doing the videos. But I also think for, for other people, it will never be the right thing. And there's nothing worse than, you know, than and seeing somebody that you can tell they're uncomfortable doing something. It creates that uncomfortable situation for everyone. Um, yeah, for me personally, it's just a case of, well, people, it, it, I am who I am. So putting myself on video to me is no different from meeting somebody um, in the street. Good stuff. Okay, well, you have to come up to Sunderland the next time you want to do an MTD for it, so if it's still relevant, whenever that's relevant, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good stuff. And Chris, um, you know, yourself, um, do you use kind of standard tools in iPhones and desktops, or have you, um, you know, gone out and bought additional um, pieces of software? Yeah, for for our tool, tools I use, uh, just following what sounds come about video, and it's the whole point, it comes down to uh, your confidence factor and the fact you can record as many things as you like. And it just going over those one or two pro processes of recording yourself. It's, it's unusual to do so. But also it's the fact that a LinkedIn post does not need to have an image or a video. Now, Laura Taylor is an amazing example of that because Laura tends to just to post words, content, what's happened in her world that day, what's happened in her business about a client, her staff, what's best practice, is it uh, how do you raise it, all those things, she just writes, and that creates the engagement. And therefore, it all comes down to what are you happy with talking about or posting about on LinkedIn? So in terms of tools, um, I'm a big user of PowerPoint and a big user of CapCut, and CapCut is really just the standalone app from TikTok. And that's free of charge. PowerPoint, I just use to sort of create content words, look at the imagery together, crop images. I think that's the other big thing is if you have, do have an image, uh, even if it's just a selfie or an image of a group of people or what have you done, seeing a client, um, always crop the picture. 
get it perfect before reposting. You do not want to have, let's say, wasted space around the image. So, I, yeah, life's really easy for me. It's cap, cut, PowerPoint. Uh, yes, I have a ring light as well, just to sort of get rid of the, the aging wrinkles, but there we go. But yes, you don't need anything expensive these days. It's as easy as it is. It's just a free, it's free platform, just for your time and imagination. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much. And um, our esteemed uh, friend, um, Phil Hopton, has commented that, yeah, on a, Mac, on, on a Mac even, on a Mac you get a load of perfect social creation tools. And, and if you just add a blue podcast mic, which, again, are, are not particularly expensive, then you got a pretty decent setup to get off and running. And for those of you that are interested, James Ashford, just at like the end of last week, posted a video about what he actually uses uh, in his home desk, uh, home office for... Um, creation of um, content as well so that would probably be worth a um worth a viewing <laughs> excuse me um so while we're talking about additional tools um i think this could be a pretty short answer but in terms of adding um followers uh, have you either of you again please um sam answer first used a kind of external tool to add you know linkedin followers automatically um you know there are various tools out there for argument's sake if you did a webinar then you know people get an automated message to you know sign up um as a follower so have you used any automated tools to increase your followers um none for me no never looked never something that i've looked into or used yeah chris yourself no not, not at all i i've had a look around see what they exist because i've heard people using them but i've never actually used it myself but today followers isn't the metric which i'm looking for it's the it's the engagement the conversation because i've got followers who pr probably i know is not on linkedin at all so it's just a number yeah yeah well it's yeah i mean they're very they're probably a bit more prevalent in the um earlier days of linkedin than they are now uh and, and certainly the use was because i think linkedin is um trying to become a bit stricter about their use because um it does actually break their t's and c's if you're using external tools but um uh, my own um son number one when he had a uh, job in recruitment then they were heavily encouraged to use a um automated tool to get his um connections followers up uh pretty rapidly and it didn't take him too long to actually do that using said automated tool but i must admit in this particular um space then i'm unaware of anyone that uses it however <clears throat> you know you talked about the the top three users earlier on in the chat chris um or the top three at the, the top lead table then you know we have jerry williams who end of july had kind of sixty five and a half thousand followers and has added eight just over 8,000 in the whatever that is, the next four months. Um, Francesca's gone from 55,000 to 58, so she's added just over 3,000. But Laura Taylor's gone from 41,500 followers to um, 67,902, which is an increase of 26,396. It's obviously gone up. So that's now I actually, you know, do like her content, you know, like you say, it's very chatty, it's very personal, but it does talk about the challenges that she has within her own business, or indeed um, the fact that she hated going to Disney World on holiday a couple of weeks ago um, with her kids, um, which I must admit I would disagree with. Um, Disney World is for people of all ages. Um, but then, but then, yeah, also, I mean, that increase in numbers is is truly phenomenal, isn't it? So I don't know how you keep up with just with, just with accepting all those requests, unless you have an esteemed colleague like our own um, Christine in the Philippines to help us out doing that. Um, but yeah, to so say how so in terms of that that growth, I mean, twenty six thousand is pretty staggering. How, how how do you actually think she's got there, and why is it and why is Laura's kind of increase in followers far more than anybody else's? Um, I really don't know. And actually, Laura is one of those people I've never really spoken to. So I think it would be wrong for me to try and comment in terms of uh, how she's creating followers or uh, anything else like that. But it, it is quite exceptional to the rule. Uh, I, I think Jerry did an amazing job during September, October, because she uh, did a, a life changing event of uh, moving to Dubai. And that created a huge amount of content and interest. And therefore, it boomed from, let's say, getting maybe five, six hundred new followers a month to a couple of thousand a month in that period. Uh, yeah. But in terms of Laura, maybe it's just consistency of post and consistency of message. But she's also a LinkedIn most valued person as well. So I don't know how that sort of makes her sit on, let's say, uh, the visibility of her as an individual on other people's LinkedIn feeds. That may be having an impact. 
yeah that's a really good point that, that must help sam any ideas no ideas at all a, apart from you know from, from face value of the post the content is very good she's very talented at the way she writes it you know from what i've seen it, it is very engaging the way that she does write her posts um I, you know, I enjoy reading those posts and I think it's it's all about that hook, isn't it? We all know that, you know, you need to click a button to do the read on. So you're only going to read on if you get hooked by that first bit. So I suppose there is consistency there. There's a real talent of how she's writing. Um, it, but in terms of the numbers, I've never seen anything like it on the platform. You know, we've all followed, um, most of us all have followed Jerry and Fran and you know, these that do have an amazing number of followers, um, but their journeys have been quite, you know, like Chris was saying, there is clear spikes when when they're posting um, really interesting content. But the the following numbers have gone up from from what I've seen, you know, um, slowly but surely, even though it, it's big numbers, but they are kind of going like this, whereas Laura's is, is, is just peaking, isn't it? Um, but no, no idea. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Um... OK, so we have a, a question that's coming from um, our friend Adam Clark. So thank you very much, Adam. So out of interest, does anybody use a personal branding expert? My answer is absolutely not, but you two are in a different league to me. So um, no, I, I can't um, imagine how can anyone create my brand? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. No, I, I've never used anything for personal branding at all. I mean, the, the way I started my business, uh, anyone that follows me on LinkedIn could probably find this story and little nuggets that I've shared. But the way I started my business, it was very kind of it the, the marketing budget, if you like, well, there wasn't one. So yeah. that was me putting myself out there and trying to build a brand. Um, well, my name is <laughs> a brand, which I seem to have done. Um, but in answer yeah. to the question, no, I've, I've never used anyone for that. However... I can totally see the value in doing so for people that you know that have that have the facilities to do so and feel that they need it. Um, but on the flip side to that, I think you can you can build quite a name for yourself without that if you stick to the consistency piece. Yeah, absolutely. And the the whole reason why the LinkedIn Top One Hundred was created it was a kind of promotional vehicle for the um, Account for Your Future conference that we ran uh, earlier this year. Again, because we had a very limited um, marketing budget, so we wanted to create as much noise as possible. Um, but in terms of personal brands or branding experts, then I'm pretty sure that Joe Edwards, who you know runs a marketing business which is focused on accountants, um, I'm sure she did a talk. I'm sure Joe did a talk at the Manchester Accountex on personal branding. But um, and knowing Joe, she's very very uh, competent at what she does. So that would have been an interesting um, uh, talk. Okay, so let's uh, move on. If any of the audience have any additional questions, then please feel free to fire them on because we begin to wrap up very, very shortly. Um, you did touch upon it earlier on, um, Sam, but in terms of you, we, we've talked about followers being um, a, a misnomer and a kind of bit of a waste of time. So what is your real metric for use of LinkedIn apart from, first of all, enjoyment? Yes, yeah, so I think um, 2021 was the year where I really did focus on what I was getting out of the platform. Um, these days, it is a gradual, you know, I'll pick up a client here and there, or I get these opportunities to do the speaking events that I enjoy doing. But in 2021, when I was really focusing on it, um, I did track the time that I was putting into the platform. So, I mean, the post Monday to Friday, the um, it, they were all pretty low in terms of the time it took me to make them apart from the Tax Tip Tuesday videos, because obviously I had to check legislation and, you know, and make sure that they were technically <laughs> correct. And sometimes it would be like take 20 until I was happy with it. Other weeks it would be one take done let's get that on the platform so I did track the time that I put into um to LinkedIn during 2021 but the number of clients I got they it pays for it paid for itself you know and I'm not talking masses and masses of clients yeah. um but actually if I were to do um, a list of the clients I've got from LinkedIn and then the clients who have come from those clients as referrals. When I look at it like that, the numbers can, you know, can seem quite impressive. They haven't all directly come from LinkedIn, but I wouldn't have that contact if it wasn't for LinkedIn and that contact has recommended me. And that's not always the case of, I mean, there are some instances where I've landed a client on LinkedIn that is way out of my area on the map, but they've then recommended me and that person has then recommended me. So I've got like these little groups of clients in areas that I potentially would never have hit. 
yeah. but also there's been quite well there's been a handful of referrals that have come from outside the accountancy space um you know so i can think of one um it consultant that i only know him via linkedin but i know that one of my clients came from him you know he's had a conversation with someone who then said oh who's your accountant or who would you recommend? And he's chose to recommend me because of what he's seen on LinkedIn. So when I've looked at it like that, it's kind of that bigger picture. Yeah. The time that I put in has definitely been worth, um, you know, what I've got out of it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Chris, any, um, obviously for yourself, you're in a different role to Sam. So um, in terms of, you know, yourself, what's your kind of metric for um you know for linkedin does that actually feed back into your job role at sage on a kind of you know day-to-day week-to-week basis not at all i, I don't think i actually have a job role at sage uh, but uh, when, when you think i don't I really track anything at all um i think what i just feel comfortable about is where i do get let's say uh comments and likes about a certain post because it means it's landing well but really my purpose which i'll use on, on linkedin is because i work for sage so it's a PLC. So I have to be careful what I talk about. I can't mm. be too controversial. I need to be sensible. I'm talking about how Sage is supporting accountants and bookkeepers, thinking about the future, talking about what we've done in the market, trying to give that sense of, let's say, what people may be missing out in terms of if they're not working with Sage. And if they are working with Sage, what else we're doing so? So really, I have a bit of restriction in terms of how I may want to speak and how I may advocate and how I may talk. Which, uh, one of my observations, and I just wonder if I ever went back into accountancy, God forbid, oh, that could be a scary thought. Um, how would I use LinkedIn then? And something which I have observed is how few accountants are actually probably talking about how they're working with certain clients. So we're talking about their selfies and the videos and the pictures, etc. Now, when I meet an accountancy firm, I may take a picture and say I've had a meeting with them. It wasn't it great. Very few accountants actually say, I've met my client today. And here they are promoting them as a business. And I'm just wondering why people don't, why accountants don't do that. Is it because they're nervous about saying, this is my client, is the client want to be engaging? And I think it's quite interesting is how the platform is going to evolve and why will people use the platform? Is it because they're trying to get intelligence? Is it trying to get insight in terms of how people are operating? Uh, is it, and this is why it's so important to understand who you are as an individual on the platform. Are you an accountant? Are you an advocate, an influencer? Or are you working with a technology platform? And all of those will basically drive what is the successful metrics you're seeking. Yeah, um, really good point. Um, I was just trying to think there, are there any accountants who kind of talk about how they work with their clients? Um, the only one I can kind of think of, present company excluded, is um, Carl, Carl Roberts. He, he does a little piece of, I had a meeting today with so-and-so and it's great to, you know, set the objectives. And now I appreciate there's, an, you know, he's not the only one before I get deluged with people saying like, I do, I do, I do. But he's, um, he's someone that sticks, um, you know, sticks for me. He, he, again, he's someone that I like his content. I, again, never met him in real life, but he does, um, he does write well. Well, Stuart Hurst does that as well. So he, he's been changing his tone and his approach. And he's quite often saying, I've, I've met a client. This is what I've done with them. This is the value of the gain from it. I think this is why it's so important is that I think people are evolving their voice and their approach in terms of how they're using LinkedIn. They're experimenting and seeing what lands well. But also, at the end of the day, if you're an accountant trying to get new work, demonstrating, illustrating and showcasing the value you're bringing to your clients is probably the best way to actually get those natural organic leads because that's what clients are aspiring to. They want someone who's going to help them in life, not just do the books, but actually help them grow and form better as, as a business. Yeah, Stuart's a good example, actually, of someone who I think he talked, I think it was on the Digio Cruels podcast um, where they had him on quite early on where he talked about how much business he'd actually won on uh, LinkedIn. And it was a pretty significant number. You know, it's about circa 150 grand, give or take. Um, again, I stand to be corrected, but it's a pretty significant number. And he he kind of got that by, you know, being very controversial and following this, you know, dinosaur accountants uh, kind of line. Um, so it would be interesting, as you say, his voice um, evolves um, to see whether, you know, this kind of Carl Roberts approach of, you know, working with people, driving them to success, keeping them accountable, um, you know, sharing the wins is um, is more successful for him. But also, Stuart's a very nice segue into the question which um, Phil Hobden has asked, because I know for, um, Stuart, who I've actually spoken to once or twice, but I don't know him um, very well at all, um, was open in the last fortnight about how 
he'd been receiving some negative you know reactions and feedback um so again you know i've um again i'm in a different league to you two but i've had one or two people who've you know sniffled and you know, kind of made critical comments which uh in a well yeah make critical comments in a in a nasty aggressive fashion but you know you just kind of rub those off um sam how about yourself um you know you must have um i say you, you must have a big assumption there but have you uh rephrase that question have you received negative feedback and how do you deal with it yeah, there's a few that that spring to mind. I feel like I have been quite lucky and there hasn't been a lot of it, but um, generally my content isn't that controversial. So I think that's probably why I've managed to keep the, you know, the negativity at, at bay. But there has been a few and there's been a few bits of feedback just from those Tactics of Tuesday videos where I've heard that somebody said something. But look, we're, we're going to get that in life, no matter where you are. And the more people you expose yourself to, the more kickback you're going to get. It, it's no different from the school playground. It's no different from working in accountancy practices where, excuse me, but it can be very bitchy and it's just the same, but on a social media platform. I think you do have to be quite tough skinned at times because people aren't always going to agree with what you're saying. But if you're willing to put your opinion out there, you have to be almost ready for that kickback. But that doesn't mean it's OK for people to be nasty. Yeah. And um, whilst we're focusing on Stuart Hurst, who's now a friend of mine, I could understand why people have a perception of Stuart. And before I invited Stuart to my office for a coffee, I expected him to be quite arrogant in his mannerism. I obviously didn't think he was a bad person. I wouldn't have invited him for coffee. But I did expect expect quite an arrogant guy behind those posts and I got the absolute op opposite he is a lovely genuine down-to-earth man with some amazing stories he's willing to help anyone um and what he does on LinkedIn I can see he is playing the game he is playing the social media game he's won more business from it than anyone I know in terms of financial gain um for you know for the company that he's with and I think it is a shame that people have to take that out of context and be actually nasty because I think there's a real clear line um, that people need to bear in mind. It's OK to disagree with somebody's opinion, but there's no need to personally attack them. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Um you know, I don't agree with everything that he puts on, but one, it's um, generally entertaining. Uh, and two, you know, life would be boring if everyone thought the same as me. So thank God people do have different views and approaches. Um, now, Chris, I, I suppose going back to Sage, probably about 12 months ago, you know, Sage were taking a lot of um, stick publicly on LinkedIn. There was a very uh, immature uh, you know, series of posts about, you know, zero is great and, and Sage is rubbish. So um, have you on, on top of that, did you get any personal stuff that has come through to you? I've never had any personal stuff. And um, I think like um, uh, anything I do post is quite balanced. Uh, it's reasoned. And I, I'm actually quite careful about what I post. Um, I'm actually quite a uh, bit of an introvert, surprisingly. I don't actually, when you think about what how what I post on social, it's very much about what I may have been doing, what I may have been doing with the, with the accountants, what Sage is doing. I do very little personal outside of work life elements on it. And then when I do post about content, it's quite reasoned because I have to be thinking about how people react. So personally, I've never had any any bad vibes at all. Um, what I do do if I do see someone having bad vibes is help help support them because sometimes I may disagree with what's actually been talked about by them. I think that's the important thing. Is uh, we're talking about how what's changed on LinkedIn. Um, twenty twenty, it was all about how people were coming together, all trying to survive, trying to think about how we all how we work together, working from home. 2021 was that continuous involvement of it, but obviously we're allowed to go out and therefore people getting their voice, people getting their confidence of what to speak. And I certainly saw that in 2021, huge level of confidence about people, what they're doing, how they're doing, uh, some bit more controversial than others. Now, 2022, um, it, I think the tone has changed a little bit more. Uh, we have seen people uh, commenting more, maybe a little bit more negatively, but it's not about product, it's about other things. And I think what we need to be focused upon is how do we approach 2023? Life is going to be, life is continuously changing, whether it's digitization or how the challenges that people are having. And this is the thing is, just because you may see someone online does not mean you know that individual. The person behind the screen is a completely different character. You have no idea what personal home life or business challenges they may be facing. And this is why we have to be quite resonant to the idea that we need to care. And that's what we social media is all about. It's about caring for others, 
being intrigued what people are doing, learning from the platform. But at the end of the day, it's actually showcasing and sharing what we're doing better and actually reaching out to people if we feel that need some help as well. Yeah, great. Uh, great answer. Thank you very much. So final final question, a um, bit of a quick file one. So um, Sam, who would you suggest, apart from um, the people on this uh, webinar, are the best people to follow in the accountancy sector? Oh, gosh, the best people to follow. I suppose it, it depends. <laughs> yes. uh, for other accountants to follow, I think we've mentioned the big names, to be honest. Fran, absolutely bubbling, lovely personality. I don't think anybody could follow Fran without getting some kind of smile out of what she posts. Very genuine, real person. Yeah. I think um, Jerry Williams has done an amazing thing on LinkedIn, and she might not be for everyone, but again, her content is engaging. She keeps it real. She shares her opinions. Um, and Stuart, for me, is is one to follow because it's comical, and and if you take it with a pinch of salt, it it'll keep you laughing. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, same sort of people as well, and I think this. What we also need to bear in mind is just don't think about the, the heavy hitters out there with large followers consider maybe some of the new people coming on board into the platform which there are people who um, have maybe been quite big on um, uh, Instagram and YouTube these accountants are now getting their voice and now coming onto LinkedIn and I think this is the whole point is the fact that when you consider who one should follow you should follow someone who is puts a smile on your face you're learning something every day they're intriguing they're saying something interesting. And more so more importantly, they may actually work with you as well. And I think that's the other thing with actually what makes a great LinkedIn post. A great LinkedIn post isn't just something you push out. It's something which should be nurtured. And therefore, if you do get engagement, creating that conversation is just as important as those first four or five words which you put on that first post which you make. Great stuff. Thank you. Well, I suppose I, I will suggest actually um, Rakesh Dewar from a firm called Dewar & Co. are based in, in Watford, but he does a load of uh, good things, quite a well-established, um, you know, uh, practice. But uh, although he actually doesn't put much video out, he does actually have a little um, uh, green screen uh, area in his uh, in his office. So he um, so I think Rakesh is uh, good. He's uh, got a, a great little firm and he, he is active on LinkedIn. So. Um, if you want someone else to follow then Rakesh is great so that wraps up our session I uh, once again say thank you very much to Sam uh, for joining us it's much appreciated and um, of course now I, I can take away from the question your content is always something that um, gets me to click on the read more uh, Chris again your um, your contributions again have been fantastic on uh, LinkedIn your videos is something I will actually have to um, get off my uh, backside and do a, a bit more video this year but you you don't need to fret i am way behind the the level of stuff that you put out and as ever uh christine in the uh philippines thank you for keeping me keep me right and um your help getting these things put together is greatly appreciated so thank you all to everyone who's joined in um uh seeing as this will be the last one we do before Christmas. I wish you all a uh, fantastic Christmas and a happy new year. And uh, Sam and Chris, once again, thanks very much for taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.